This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> The last several decades, one of the most important people in international finance is actually not that well known to the public. Her name is Kristalina Gorgieva. She was a senior commissioner of the European Commission. She was the chief executive of the World Bank, and now she is the managing director of the IMF. And in that position, she heads an organization whose purpose is to help countries that have financial problems. Today, because of the pandemic, there are many countries that have financial problems, and there are many people that are calling Kristalina. You've been a senior commissioner of the European Commission, and now you're the managing director of the IMF. In getting these positions, was it more difficult because you were a woman or you were from a small country called Bulgaria? Where was there more prejudice, against being a woman or from Bulgaria? Well, ultimately, I got these jobs. So whatever the prejudice was didn't hold me back. If I am to make a call on that, I would say being from a small country always requires to work twice as hard as others to prove yourself. When you were growing up in a small country and then behind the Soviet curtain, Iron Curtain, um, did you ever think that you would wind up in these kind of positions as a young girl? <laughs> did you imagine anything like this? David, even today, there are moments when I'm pinching myself. Am I the head of the IMF right. coming from where I'm coming from? Uh, so no. <laughs> so the, many people don't know honestly what the IMF and the World Bank do. So can mm -hmm. you explain uh, what they actually do and why they're different and why we need them? So in the end of the Second World War in a beautiful place in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, enlightened leaders came together and said we have to help the world to not get into war. And to do so, we need to help the economy to perform better. And they created these two sister institutions, the IMF, with a mandate on financial stability, growth, and employment, and the World Bank to invest in reconstruction of then war-torn countries. Okay, so your job at the IMF uh, is to Look, take a country that, mm -hmm. let's say, has financial problems. They, their economy is weak or they have other kind of crises. And you can help them through that difficult time by lending them money. Mm -hmm. um, and right now you have about 270 some billion dollars outstanding. Yep. Um, but do you actually get paid it back? So the uh, loans we provide are with very um, attractive interest rates because it is the money of our members. They extend to each other a helping hand. For the poorest members, we charge no interest. These are soft loans, uh, uh, much softer than the traditional uh, IMF loans. Countries pay us back. The poorer countries have longer maturity and longer time to serve their loans to us. But what matters is not just the money. What matters is that we work with countries to make them stronger so they can repay with more ease. And that is absolutely paramount for people to know about the fund. We are there to help countries to have strong economic fundamentals. Okay. Now there are some people who say that sometimes when the IMF has lent money in the past, let's say to Argentina or Greece, mm -hmm. the terms are, let's say, draconian. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, um, I would say, revulsion in those countries against the mm -hmm. harsh IMF terms. Is that still fair? or? Those things are the days of the past. Well, the, the, of course, we learn from experience. And one of the things we learned is that we have to pay very close attention to the impact of programs on people. Policies are for people. Macro decisions have micro consequences. And we are integrating this much more in the programs we do today. We think about social spending, put the floor don't allow education and health to be so dramatically impacted 
that human capital of the country is eroded. Or let's suppose I'm the president of a country and I, mm -hmm. you know, would like some extra money and can I call you up and say I, I'd like to borrow some money and how hard is it to get the money, how long does it take? And are people afraid of calling you because mm -hmm. their own credit ratings might go down if it's known that they have to borrow money from the IMF? If you're a president of a country in trouble, you better call because if you do not have access to markets, and some developing countries don't, then the only way to boost your economy is to rely on the IMF, the World Bank, institutions like us. Because this is an exogenous shock, it is truly an emergency. The way we respond is different from what we do when a country is in trouble because it mismanaged its economy. It is the fault of those uh, that have been governing at that time. What we are asking countries is two questions. One, please, when you get the money, prioritize your health system and helping the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable part of the economy. Two, show me the receipts. What did you use the money for? We are advising countries to spend more, but keep the receipts. We want accountability, okay. not just to us, but to the taxpayers in uh, the countries. And uh, we have advanced already financial lifelines to 75 countries in record short time. I mean, in this place, when a crisis knocks on the door, we turn on a dime. We are the world's first responder in crisis. Now, recently, you have asked the G20 to more or less have a debt forgiveness uh, mm -hmm. situation so that some people that owe you money wouldn't have to pay it back. Why did you need to do that? When we uh, got hit by this crisis, four poor countries, that is devastating twice as much as it is for countries that are wealthier. Why? Because one, they have weak health systems. Two, they have very little capacity to respond on their own. And three, a number of, th of them have had high debt levels by that time. So the economy is in standstill. If debt services not put in standstills, these countries have to decide, do they pay doctors and nurses and save lives or serve their debt? And that is bad for them, but it is also bad for the rest of the world because a country in desperate situation falling to pieces turns into a security threat to its neighbors and the rest of the world. So you have lots of economists here. Um, what are the economists here telling you about the state of the economy in the world? Because of the pandemic, are we likely to have a kind of global recession for another year or so? We have some optimism on two grounds. The first one is exceptionally decisive action by central banks and by finance authorities. They put a floor under the world economy. We on our side have done our part for the countries that have no resources on their own. The second reason we are somewhat more optimistic today than we were a couple of months ago is that we see the world learning how to function with the pandemic still with us. But make no mistake, the recovery is partial and it is uneven. We are not going to see in 2021 return to pre-COVID conditions and we are seeing big divergence, parts of the economy doing right. really well and parts falling behind. And this is my biggest concern, that we may come on the other side of this crisis with more inequality, higher debt, higher deficits, right and a climate crisis still hanging uh, on us. If we are strong as a world, we ought to come together. A massive coordinated stimulus can 
make it so that we have a better economy on the other side than we had in 2019. How did you wind up in the Fiji Islands? I got the letter, the invitation to go and teach. I had to virtually go to the map and see where Fiji was. So let's talk about uh, your background. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, you grew up in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. uh, Bulgaria at that time was behind the Iron Curtain, so it was not a powerful country in the West, and it was actually a small and I think relatively poor country. It turns mm -hmm. out you were from a prominent family, but not a wealthy family. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, so yes, I was um, uh, a daughter of uh, ordinary, uh, people. My, my father was a road engineer. My mother stayed at home to look after us. Modest means. Very happy childhood. Very loving parents. Yes, my family was prominent, but I didn't know that until I was in my 20s. Why? Because my father was concerned that if we talk about the uh, revolutionary who was my great-grandfather and the fact that we can trace back our origins five centuries into the past, that may not gel well with the power of the proletariat. So when you're growing up in, the Bulgaria, in Bulgaria in, let's say, the 50s and 60s, uh, did, were you required to learn Russian? Of course, of course. And um, English? Yes. No, I actually, my mother was a Francophone, so she sent me to learn French. I had some uh, French. When Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union and Glasnost and Perestroika came to Bulgaria, I was uh, able to apply for a scholarship in the West. And in six months, I learned English enough to pass to win a British Council scholarship to go to London School of Economics. That was incredible, to be on the other side of the Iron uh, Curtain. And what I found out over there, having access to information, was that my country was broke. My country was so much deep in debt that I couldn't imagine how it is going to survive. Sure enough, two years later, Bulgaria the economy collapsed and Bulgaria turned the page uh, away from socialism to market economy. How did you wind up in the Fiji Islands? <laughs> now that is a story. So when I was at London School of Economics, a professor noticed me as somebody who is you know, quite professional. He then became the Dean of Economics uh, in the University of South Pacific in Suva, in Fiji. He's sitting there wondering how he can find highly qualified professors that are willing to work for very little money. And so, brilliant idea. Wrote to this Bulgarian woman. I got the letter, the invitation to go and teach. I had to virtually go to the map and see where Fiji was. Getting from Bulgaria to Fiji in 1990 was an adventure. And so I'm landing in Fiji. I handed my passport to the uh, uh, passport control lady. She takes it, types something, looks at me and says, where are you from? I said, Bulgaria. She types again, looks at me and says, there is no such country. The first Bulgarian to go to Fiji. Now, the professor really liked me. He offered me a job. I still remember he offered me a job, $16,000 a year. I had no idea of my market value. At that time, I was paid $100 a month, but I still didn't take the job. Why? Because it was so far, so far from Bulgaria. So I went back. I got a chance to go to MIT to come to the United States, and the rest is history. But did you ever say, I'm not going back to Bulgaria, I'm now in the West, and I'm going to stay in the West? Actually, no. I came to um, MIT 
with the idea to spend one year, learn as much as I can, and bring this knowledge back to Bulgaria. I actually had a contract to write a textbook on environmental economics as an outcome of this visit. But the World Bank called me up. They offered me a summer job. I came for the summer. The fourth day, I mean, this consulting job, I got a call and I got an offer to stay at the bank. Why? At that time, the bank was looking for environmental economists, 92, post-Rio, Czech. They were desperate for women. They were very male-dominated, so Czech. And they were opening up towards uh, the Soviet Union, former Eastern Bloc, Russian speakers, Czech. So <laughs> I took the job. I, I said, right. well, you know, it's a, it, this is such an opportunity to work here. And then uh, I, I, I did incredibly interesting jobs within the bank. I raced up in the, uh, in the ranks. Right. And uh, uh, one day I got the call to go to Europe. What did you actually do there? What was your job? I had um, first the job of humanitarian and crisis commissioner. And it was an incredible experience. I had the front seat position in all the terrible crises that were happening at that time from uh, Haiti earthquake to the uh, triple disaster in Japan to the Syrian war. And I, I was able to mobilize the very best of Europe to help people in terrible need and reform the crisis response system of Europe. Uh, one of my um, strong memories of this time, I mean, uh, in a village talking to a Syrian girl who wants to go back to school, but there is no schooling available. And I said to her, her name was Aisha, I said, Aisha, I hope you would be able to go back to, to school. I walked out of there and I thought, my hoping means nothing to her. My acting would make a difference. Right. And then we mobilized and we scaled up massively access to education for Syrian refugee children. Have you ever thought of running for office in Bulgaria or you're quite happy where you are? I always take the job I have as what takes my full concentration. I pour my heart in it. You talked about Bretton Woods and how the IMF and the World Bank were created in the late uh, 1940s. If you had been there then, uh, how would you change the structure for the IMF or the World Bank? And might you think there could be some time in the future when some of the structure might be changed to make it better? Well, they were created uh, uh, very thoughtfully with institutions that uh, evolve with time. Uh, their shareholding changes as the world economy uh, changes. What is required from us is to relentlessly pursue this adjustment. So the IMF, in terms of its governance and the shareholding, reflects the world of today. Right. Uh, and that takes a lot of work bringing the membership uh, together. Uh, the IMF has done a successful uh, quarter adjustment. This is changing shareholding. Uh, um, and now is due to take stock again. So uh, between now and 2023, that would be a very important uh, job to do. So what percentage of the people who are in the staff, are they Americans or from overseas? And what percentage are male or female and so forth? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, just about 75% um, um, of staff from uh, all countries in the world and around 25% are Americans. Uh, logically, for many positions, we recruit locally, like for some of the assistants, coordinators. For the professional pool, we recruit internationally and competitively. Okay. Uh, broadly speaking, we are about the same men and women, but you wouldn't be surprised. When we go up, there are more men then we have down, and this is something that I'm zeroing on. Uh, when I came, directors, this is the uh, layer of management that has 
most important right. operational responsibility were 25% women, 75% men. Now they are 40, 60. Okay. And I would drive this pipeline of talented women not because I am obsessed with percentages, but because diversity matters. Having different regional perspectives, having men and women working together makes us more effective. We make better decisions as a result. Historically, the World Bank uh, president was picked more or less by the United States administration, the president of the United States, and the head of the IMF was more or less picked by Europeans, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, you foresee that that will change or that's going to continue for the foreseeable future? I think that there would be more and more a demand to make these positions open for competition based on uh, merits. Uh, and even if you take uh, this round, uh, yes, I'm a European, Europe aligned uh, to nominate me, but I'm a European from a country that in the mid-90s benefited from an IMF uh, program. I do belong to emerging markets, and emerging markets were very loud in supporting me uh, for that reason. So I want to see that process uh, to continue. Why? Because institutions are much stronger when the whole world believes they belong to uh, all of us. Now, China has become a major economic power, I guess the second mm -hmm. largest economy in the world. Does China have the influence in the IMF or the World Bank proportionate to its uh, overall global economy now? Well, they have, uh, they have increased their shareholding in, in both uh, institutions. Uh, uh, they have been uh, also very active in uh, supporting uh, the institutions. Uh, in the case of the IMF, China, the US, the rest of the world in this crisis stepped up significantly support for us to be able to extend concessional lending. And I see the um, engagement of uh, China as, uh, as constructive. That is so very important when we are in the midst of the worst crisis we have had since the Second World War. So the IMF stands for the International Monetary Fund. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of changing it to say it stands for I am fair, I am friendly? <laughs> Wouldn't that be I better? I love that. Most people here in the fund say it stands for it is mostly fiscal. But I much prefer the definition you gave. And actually, this is what I would relentlessly work for. We at the fund to always think of the people whose lives are impacted by the policies we recommend. Um, you're the most prominent person in the West from Bulgaria, as far as I know. Maybe there's somebody else, but I can't think of anybody else. So I assume you could go back to Bulgaria whenever you wanted to and run for president of Bulgaria. Yeah, I don't know if that's a better job than the one you currently have, but you've ever thought of running for office in Bulgaria or you're quite happy where you are? I always take the job I have as what takes my full concentration, I pour my heart in it. I never ever think of what next. So as long as I'm the head of the IMF, it is I, the IMF and the membership that has my complete dedication.